Uh, I am really honored to introduce Hilbert Margot. He is a World War II combat veteran, a special friend, and a friend to all veterans with a unique story to tell. Uh, Hilbert was born in Jacksonville, Florida in February of 1924. So for those of you who can do the math, his next birthday will be his 100th. He is the eldest of identical twin boys, along with his brother Howard. They graduated uh, from high school in 1942. That's the year I was born, by the way. Um, and within two weeks, they enrolled at the University of Florida in the ROTC program. They shortly after that decided to join the Army Reserve Unit, and a few months later, that unit, as part of World War II, was called to active duty, and they received orders to report to basic training in April of 1943. After 13 weeks of basic, they were assigned to the Army Specialized Training Program. However, that program was canceled in early 1944, and the brothers were separated. Uh, about six months after that, their mother wrote a letter to President Roosevelt requesting that they be allowed to serve together, as that's something that mom and the brothers wanted very, very much. Uh, at the time, in World War II, brothers were not allowed to serve together in combat. However, the power of Hilbert's mom, shortly after she wrote the letter to President Roosevelt, the brothers were reassigned and put together uh, as Howard, Hilbert's younger brother, joined Hilbert in the 105 millimeter gun battery for Oklahoma, in training in Oklahoma, I'm sorry. In December 1944, they uh, took a cruise to Europe on an intimate cruise ship along with about 5,000 other troops. Was it 16 days? 15 days to cross the ocean, and they did that, of course, in a convoy that did make it across. They wound up in Marseille, France, and in early January, that was early January 1945, and less than two weeks later, they were engaged in combat in wingen sur motor France. From there, they proceeded north and were in combat action in Alsace and Ardennes in both of those campaigns, and then in the Rhineland campaign in Germany. They were present early on the morning of April 29, 1945, at the liberation of the Dachau prisoner and concentration camp. The war in Euro the European theater ended in May of 1945, after which they entered Germany, uh, Austria, I'm sorry, and served in the Army of Occupation in the Salzburg, Austria area. They shipped home in March of 1946, were discharged with the rank of PFC. Unfortunately, um, Hilbert's brother Howard, as Hilbert says, went over the rainbow and passed away on February 19th, 2017. Once they got back to the United States, they went back to college. During college, they uh, had a business selling housewares door to door, very entrepreneurial. Um, that morphed into a postgraduate retail furniture business, and that became a career which Hilbert likes to tell. He retired from three different times, the last and final time at age 93. Uh, he's most modest regarding his many honors, which continue. Uh, the most recent one was about a week ago at Holocaust Remembrance Day here in Georgia, where he was honored by the Georgia Commission of Holocaust. Without further introduction, my friend, Hilbert Margot. Okay, thanks. First of all, I want to thank uh, Art for inviting me to be here. It's already a great day. Uh, as some of you, I'm sure, think the same way, uh, you get out of bed in the morning, it's already a good day. <laughs> if anybody can't hear me at any time in the back, just raise your hand and I'll talk louder. Uh, what I'm about to say and present due to time constraints is going to be a, sort of a shortened version of what I normally present because I want to allow enough time to show some pictures of taken, uh, original pictures taken the day of uh, liberation at Dachau prisoner camp. Um, 
See if I can get this thing to work. As Art mentioned, we were at the University of Florida, ROTC, horse drawing artillery, 105 millimeter howitzers. The horses were real, the howitzers were real, our rifles were made out of wood, ready for combat. <laughs> Anyhow, that's why the uniform were riding pants, jodhpurs, because it was horse-drawn artillery. We were both trained as gunners on 105 millimeter howitzers. As Art also mentioned, we ended up after 13 weeks of basic training, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, we also were trained as gunners on 105 millimeter howitzers. And that occasion, our rifle carbines were real. Uh, this picture here I show because that's my twin brother Howard. Happened to be uh, outside of Würzburg, Germany, a uh, Nuremberg, I'm sorry, a suburb uh, of, called Firth. It was a German army air base there. Of course, the Germans had all pulled out when uh, our unit approach. We were in, in combat, we were uh, in direct support of the 222nd Infantry Regiment uh, at all times. Um, so anyhow, Howard uh, went into one of the buildings at the abandoned airport, air base. He saw a stack of, it was winter time, saw a stack of German white silk parachutes had his bayonet handy, so he cut off a big piece of fabric from one of the parachutes and made himself a nice neck scarf, as you can see. Uh, a couple of days later, when I was able to see him, because uh, I said, where's my neck scarf? Well, he didn't think about me at the time. So much for brotherly love. <laughs> That's just a picture of me somewhere in Germany. Uh, that picture there is me as a gunner. And um, I would tell you this, we were very lucky for a number of reasons. Because we actually were only in actual combat four and a half months. We were in France longer than that, but actual combat was only four and a half months for reasons beyond our control, but we were very fortunate. But during that four and a half months period, we never were present more than a few feet or yards away from our howitzers. Uh, each howitzer we had in our gun battery, we had four howitzers. Howard was the gunner on number two, I was a gunner on number three. And we could get fire missions at any time, morning, noon, or night. So we had our sleeping bags. We were always within a few feet or yards of our howitzer, regardless of what the elements were, whether it was freezing cold, s snow, sleet, whatever, you name it, rain. Um, I get a kick sometimes out of movies when they show soldiers jumping into foxholes and whatnot. But what they don't show is sometimes those foxholes that some of you guys I'm sure are aware of were filled with water. Maybe half filled with water, but the guy, you had to jump in, even though it was very freezing cold. They don't show that in movies. Okay, now, I'm going to skip stories about how the two of us, of course, won the war. I'll skip all that. <laughs> I'm sure you don't have interest in it anyway. Anyhow, uh, this picture. Now, this is an aerial view on the right side. I can use this pointer. This was the prisoner camp, the Dachau prisoner camp. All these are barracks. This was where the prisoners early every morning had to fall out for roll call. These were administration buildings. Here was actually a prison where the most famous uh, prisoner in that unit was uh, 
Father Nemoor, famous, he was prisoner there uh, throughout maybe at least three or four years during the war. Kept there. Amazingly enough, I read where the Germans allowed him to hold special services in that prison for Christmas Eve services, which he did. Now, on this side, this is the huge SS German army camp that controlled the prisoner camp. The uh, hospital, the uh, where the ovens and all were, was up here. Not in the prisoner camp. This area here was uh, actually a garden where the prisoners raised vegetables for the SS uh, and German soldiers. Not for the prisoners. But that was one of the jobs the prisoners had to do was raise vegetables in this area here. Right here, this was the entrance to the prisoner camp right there. Now, there was a building next door. This is still there, which I'll have time. I'll show a picture of what exists today. But next to it was a building where the prisoners were, had to be entered first. Very large gates. Uh, the, some of the pictures I'm going to show uh, was done by a Sergeant Don Patterson that I met some years ago via telephone conference call with a friend of mine who happens to be a lawyer in Kansas. And Don Patterson was also a lawyer in Kansas. So my friend arranged a, a teleconference call with me to talk to Don Patterson. And Don told me his story. His tank was about halfway to Munich when they got orders to turn around, go back, and enter the Dachau prisoner camp and plan on spending the night there. Uh, Don said that was the orders. No, he didn't know anything about such camp. We didn't either. But anyhow, he had a, told me he had an official army camera with plenty of film to take combat pictures from his tank. So he said they got there about 4.30 in the afternoon. To set the scene, my twin brother and I, which I'll explain in a little bit, we got there early, very early, Sunday morning, April 29th, 1945. Now, the official surrender took place about 2.30 that afternoon. Don said he and his tank mates arrived about 4.30 that afternoon. So he said by 5 o'clock, he would start taking pictures. So the pictures that I'm going to show really is the ones I obtained from Don Patterson, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, the crematorium, as I say, in the ovens were right up here. This is where the crematorium is. Not in the prisoner camp, but in the SS German camp. The SS German camp, SS officers, some of them had their wives, their children living with them there. Um, so they knew what was going on. The town of Dachau itself was adjoining the SS camp. Um, they knew what was going on. This is the official surrender ceremony, which I say took place about 2.30. just so happened um, early the day before, a Swiss representative arrived, got permission to talk to the SS officer in charge, told him he could arrange for a peaceful, that the American army was coming close. 
In combat, the 45th Division was always on our left. The 36th Texas Division was always on our right. So two of the three divisions, sometimes all three divisions were engaged in combat. Other times, only two divisions were engaged in combat. The third division enjoyed a day, a day, and I had two days rest period. Uh, that's the way it worked. So uh, General Henning Linden, our assistant division commander, was ordered by General Collins to go there with his entourage to accept the official surrender of the prisoner camp, not the SS camp. The 45th Division came in from our left, and they entered uh, maybe before about noontime that day into the SS German Army camp. Uh, okay, my twin brother Howard and I, this is a scene early, very early, Sunday morning, April 29th, 1945. The next military objective was Munich. We were eight to 10 miles north of Munich, depending on where you were at in Munich. We were on a two-lane country road. We got orders to pull over on the right side of the road there was a wooded area on both sides of the road, but on the right side was just enough of a clearing to accommodate our four howitzers. Depending on the terrain and the situation, sometimes our four howitzers were quite a distance apart. Sometimes we could certainly see each other, but not close. This particular time, our four houses were as close together as you could possibly imagine. We had some fire missions in the direction of Munich, and one of our Jeep drivers came by. Everybody smelled a very strong odor. Jeep driver said there must be a chemical factory on the woods on the left side of the road to create that very strong odor. My brother Howard came over to me and he said, what it reminds him of when our, we were kids and our mother would go to a meat market and buy a freshly killed chicken. Those days you could only buy the whole chicken, you couldn't buy just parts. And she would take the chicken home, hold it over the gas flame in the kitchen to burn off any remaining pin feathers. In so doing, it would burn the skin and some of the fat of the chicken. He said, that's the odor that it reminds him of. So I asked my gun sergeant permission for Howard and I to go over through the woods on the left side, see if we could determine the source of the, small, of the strong odor. He said, okay, go ahead, but don't stay too long because right now we have a lull in firing missions. We don't know how long we're gonna be here. So the two of us went through the woods, maybe 15 minutes later, the first thing we saw was a line of railroad boxcars. We crawled over between two boxcars. We looked to our right, and this is what we saw the picture you're looking at now. The reason why this, and we had a little brownie box camera that we had liberated just a few weeks earlier. The only film we had was what was in the camera itself. So we weren't anxious to take pictures because we didn't know how much film we had, how many exposures. But this particular boxcar, this picture, we took this exact picture that you're looking at, filled with dead bodies. The reason why this boxcar was distinctive, different, was because it was the only one that was open that we saw that had this one body with the legs hanging out. Because of that, every, a lot of soldiers that came behind for days, the official photographers, army photographers, everybody took that picture of that boxcar because it was different from the rest of them. The, uh, so it's, it's in a lot of areas. You probably can find it on the internet. Now, the only reason why this particular picture was taken by Don Patterson, 
was because while I have the original picture, it's fade, somewhat faded out over these years because the quality of that little brownie box camera nowhere near as good as the one that Don Patterson had, an official uh, camera. Now, this is, uh, I don't have time to go into the whole story, but when I showed the picture of the SS camp, there was one area that had a wall, and I should have pointed out, that was called the coal yard. Uh, the train itself, the first three cars, maybe four, actually entered inside the SS camp because that's how they got provisions, a lot of, especially coal that they needed for many purposes, operate the hospital, the barracks, uh, the crematorium, etc. cetera. Uh, in this case, these, it would go inside the actual SS camp and right there was a, what they call the coal yard. Well, the first three cars, maybe four, were open cars. This is a picture of one of them. Uh, when the 45th Division guys came in, that's the first thing they saw were these dead bodies in these open cars. So when some of them entered the actual camp, they rounded up what was left because most of the SS had pulled out the day before when the Swiss representative told them that they had a choice, either fight against overwhelming odds or arrange a peaceful surrender and save a lot of lives. The SS officer in charge said, okay, uh, we'll, we'll leave and we'll take a, most of our men. He left one junior lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant SS Weikert, to actually make the surrender with his white flag. He took the rest, he took about over 2,000 the healthiest prisoners available, all Jewish, on a forced march because he told the Swiss rep that he would go to defend Munich. He was no dummy. He had no intention of going to defend Munich. He wanted to end up in the Austrian Alps, which they call the Redoubt area, where he would have a good bunch of slave labor to take care of him and his men because he knew the war was not going to last too much longer at that time. And that's where he hoped to go. Uh, as far as they got was right close to the Austrian border. That's another story. This is a picture. Uh, this is what some guys saw. We didn't see any prisoners because the prisoners were all told that the night before that the camp was going to be a range of peaceful surrender, stay in the barracks. Uh, I've talked to some survivors to 70th anniversary of the liberation in Dachau, and most of the, a high percentage of the prisoners at the time, it was over 32,000 prisoners in the barracks. Of course, we were there when we went into the camp. We didn't know anything about such camps. We knew the camps existed, but we didn't know the details, whatever. The camps were not military objectives at all. That's why there was no specific operation to try and save any of these camps. Uh, most of the, a high percentage of the prisoners on that day suffered from typhus. The Germans had nothing to combat the lice that created typhus. All they could do was shave the hair off the prisoners because that's where the lice would nest. When the U.S. Army arrived, we had DDT powder, which was used to kill the lice. Still took almost a month for the U.S. Army to eradicate the typhus uh, in the prisoner camp. Uh, my brother and I 
stayed us. We knew we couldn't stay long. So this is another picture of dead bodies inside one of the buildings. There was no shortage of dead bodies. So some, a, number, a number of them were outside. We could see the ones that were outside. We never went into any of the buildings. This is another picture Don Patterson took. Another picture he took. This is, you can see the moat, the fence. And this probably was around 5.30 that afternoon of the 29th. This is the coal yard, the German soldiers. When the, some of the guys of the 45th went in and they saw these dead bodies in these open boxcars, they lined up. What was left were mostly young uh, Wehrmacht, young German soldiers. They lined up a bunch of them in front of that wall, in the coal yard, and a, like a firing squad took place. Uh, I don't condone what they did, but I understand their mentality. They had been in combat a lot longer than we had. Some of them may have had friends, relatives, neighbors. There were at the Malmody massacre, which the Germans did the same thing to American troops. So, who knows? Now, this is the, these pictures from here on, mostly, not all, but most of them were taken by my son uh, at the 70th anniversary a few years ago. My son, daughter-in-law, and two grandchildren and my wife, uh, we were all able to go on the trip. By the way, Art, hold up five fingers when you got, I got five minutes and then I got to shut up. <laughs> this is a sign when you leave the prisoner camp to go over into the former, which is no longer there, the SS camp, you go over, they still have it if you go there today, they kept there's a small bridge that goes over and a small, uh, not too long, but the moat. They have the bridge and the moat is still there and part of the two fences uh, to go over to where the crematorium. Every day we were there four or five days, including Munich and Dachau, we had light rain every day. So. That's why you see umbrellas. This is the room where prisoners were told to remove everything, take everything off, get ready to take a shower. These pictures, I said, were taken by my son. This is the ovens. There were actually three there. This is two of the three ovens. Now, why? What was the source of this very strong odor? It just so happened. See, that was the thinking. Okay, there was very little combat that took place there. The Germans' the army was in retreat. Um, this is another story I just don't have time because it, it, it'll take 10 minutes to give you all the details. Art? What are we doing? This scene here, the, the dark spots are main uh, concentration camps. This is Dachau down here. Mauthausen is over here. That's actually in Austria. Every, every main camp had a lot of little dots around them. Those were all sub camps. Uh, what were the subcamps for? That's where they had a lot of slave labor working in nearby factories. Okay. Um, I talked to one survivor from Holland. He wasn't Jewish. I asked him the same question I asked a number of survivors. What was he, where was he at? What was he doing early the morning of April 29th, 1945? He said he wasn't in the main prisoner camp, he was in a subcamp, nearby subcamp called, the nearest one is called Allah, A-L-L-A-C-H. He said he was working with other uh, prisoners in a BMW factory. 
not making engines for BMW automobiles, making engines for German fighter airplanes. That was, there were others I talked to that, uh, one told me he served in an underground facility building the compacts, components for the V-2 rockets. Uh, that was his function and told me some interesting information about that. Go there today, this is what you're going to see. Those are the concrete foundations of where the barracks stood. I'm going to skip. These are the replica barracks that are there today. When my brother went to the 50th anniversary, I couldn't go because I had business obligations at the time. He came back, he told me, well, uh, it's still there, but it's more like a Boy Scout camp than what we saw when we were there. This is inside there again, it looks very nice. <laughs> this is the gate, that's the main gate, entrance gate. And we went in, after we saw the boxcars, we went through the gate just following other 222nd Infantry soldiers. We didn't know what was in there, we just went in following them. I'll have to skip this story. I'll skip this story. This is a survivor and his wife. They live in Montreal, Canada. I asked him the same question. Where was he at? He said he was in the group of the forced march just before the Austrian border. All the German SS were in vehicles, except for a few guards that were walking with the prisoners. And he said suddenly, they all took off in the vehicles. The guards jumped in the vehicles and they all took off. They knew that the 42nd advance unit was coming close. Somehow they knew that. And they just all took off. So he said that's when he was liberated, was right close to the Austrian border. Well, this was a... I had to arrange, I had a number of interviews over there and this was a... I was going to an interview with you, but this is interesting, real quick. This is a Romanian uh, TV, had just completed interviewing another veteran, and they stopped me, asked me some questions, told them I have to go to this. I was interviewed, uh, prearranged, would you believe, Chinese national television. <laughs> Took a, over an hour for the interview on camera, and I asked the Chinese lady, I said, I'm just curious. Why in the world would Chinese national television be here interviewing somebody like me? She said, well, because during the Second World War, when the Japanese invaded Manchuria, which was part of China, they did a lot of nasty deeds like the Nazis did. And that, because of that, the Chinese people are, have been interested all these years about what the Nazis did. So that was the answer. She sent me two CDs. One was the actual interview. The other one, as it appeared on Chinese television. Very interesting. It lasted maybe 10, 15 minutes. Part of it had me talking, of course, in English. But that was it. Very interesting. I want to thank everybody for listening, and I always enjoy talking to a younger group of younger people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just want to leave by saying, anybody here that hasn't reached 90 yet, and I hope that's all of you, when you get past 90, life presents more challenges. Some of them can be a bit difficult. But I hope and pray that all of you get there. Thank you for listening. So, Mr. Margo will take questions for a few minutes if anybody has any.
Yes, sir. Mr. Barber, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Wait a minute. Wait, wait for the mic. Thank you. Mr. Margo, thank you so much for coming. Um, I can't imagine what you've been through, but thank you for sharing a small part of it with us. And I wish you could tell me two more things, if you would. In the few days between, the <laughs> between Dachau and the actual surrender of the Germans, where did your unit go, you and your unit? And secondly, with respect to the SS guys who were trying to make it to Austria, uh, can you tell us any more about their ultimate fate? If I understood the question, and I'm not sure I did, two questions. Uh, and I'll answer it this way and hope that that's the answers. The last, I'd say, three, four days in May, uh, it was, we were on, uh, see, we had a two and a half ton army truck that hauled our howitzer, and we, the sergeant and the driver sat in the cab, and the rest of us, each gun crew was consisted of 10 men, sergeant, corporal, and eight enlisted men, privates or PFCs. It was bumper to bumper traffic, like the worst traffic in downtown Atlanta. <laughs> you would sit and sit and then move a few feet at a time and stop again. And it was going through some of the towns. Civilians would be lined up and this was southern Germany, close to the Austrian border. Civilians would be lined up on both sides of the road when you went through a town or a village, welcoming American forces as conquering heroes, cheering. But they had one message. It was like a church choir that was rehearsed. And my brother and I could speak pretty good German because we brought up in a household, our parents spoke Yiddish. Yiddish is actually a German derivative. Some of the words are identical, some of them the only difference is in the, pronounce, the way you pronounce them. So by that time we could speak pretty good and understand a lot more. And what were they saying? The war will not end until you defeat the Russians. We heard that over and over. Think about that. They were scared to death of the Russians. They welcomed the Allied forces, greeted them. Now, as far as SS, the only live SS that I ever had contact with was after the war during the Army of Occupation. We ended up near the, uh, in a living in an old monastery near Salzburg, Austria. Nearby was a stockade left over from the Austrian army. The U.S. Army filled that stockade with SS prisoners. We had to stand guard 24-7 around that stockade. And when we had some snow periods, we were not happy soldiers. The war was over, yet we had to stand guard, heavy snow, uh, that was the only kind. Then we would take them out. What would we do with them? Every morning we would take them out into the woods, nearby the mountains, chop down trees. They would chop down trees, cut the trees up into firewood, and then it would all be loaded on trucks and hauled back into Salzburg to be distributed first to bakers and then to army units and civilians for their stoves, for the bakers to bake bread and for civilians to heat their home and cooking, whatever. That was the contact we had with SS uh, officers. Any other questions? Uh, the, uh, the colonel that left with his 2,000 some odd troops toward Austria, uh, were they eventually neutralized? The colonel that left with the 2,000 prisoners toward Austria, the SS colonel, were they eventually caught? Oh, I say neutralized. Neutralized, I'm sorry. We, 
I don't really know. Just like I didn't know any of the individual SS prisoners that we took up into the mountainside to cut down trees. I mean, we had our C rations and K rations, so that was what we ate. They brought them cups of, well, they called it soup. Uh, today, it would be somewhat similar to matzo ball soup, if you know what that is, chicken matzo ball soup. Uh, and that's what the prisoners had every day because it was easy, something easy to prepare. It was really hot water with a ball of dough with some, I don't know, salt, pepper, whatever they put in to give it a little taste. And that's what the prisoners ate every day. Next question. Hilby, uh, Kerry King, I did your interview at the Legacy, uh, on the Legacy Project at the History Center. First of all, thank you for coming and thanks for liberating Dachau. Um, being Jewish, I had lots of relatives that were still in Eastern Europe. Of course, I grew up in the United States. My grandparents left there. Uh, I got stationed in Germany right after I finished up at Fort Sill and Fort Benning. And while I was in Germany in 1963, I visited Dachau. The original barracks at that time were still up as were the, the German SS camp was still available and there were ashes in the trays in the crematorium when I was there in 63. There were flowers there that had been placed and I, I'm sure you, you saw those as well uh, with all the plaques from the different countries. I went back again in 2007 on a trip to Germany with Brian Tate and some others from our group and at that point they had torn down all the barracks buildings and all they had left as you indicated was this Boy Scout looking building uh, with photographs of whatever happened. I lost 11 relatives, six of whom died in Dachau. And what the guide told us the day we were there, uh, the guide told us that Dachau was the training ground or the proving ground for mass destruction, mostly of Jews, but also of other opponents of what they considered the Nazi regime. Did, did anybody tell you that when you were there, that, it, that Dachau was actually their first effort to train SS in mass killings and cremations and gas chambers? For, you mentioned the gas chamber. Um, those of you, for those of you who don't know, when they said, you're here to take a shower, the shower was, uh, was loaded with poison gas. So in case you didn't know it, there's a big sign in there that says, never again. So if you would just comment on whether or not you, they ever told you that Dachau was the training ground for the other German camps. And thank you again for everything you did. I understand that the day that my brother and I entered, we knew nothing about those camps. We didn't know what we were seeing. We didn't understand what we were seeing. We didn't know why. Why are these dead bodies around? Uh, I would tell you, high school kids especially, when I talk to them, one question that always comes up is, how did you feel being Jewish, walking into Dachau and seeing these various dead bodies? And not all prisoners at Dachau at the time were Jewish. Only the Germans were great at separating, record keeping. They had special barracks just for Jewish prisoners. They had other barracks that were just prisoners from Western Europe, France, so forth. They had other barracks just for Russians. That's the way they separated them, for whatever reason. But my answer was always the same. Uh, before we got to Dachau, we had seen a number of dead bodies. Unfortunately, some were Allied forces, uh, a lot of, some were more so with German soldiers, a lot of dead horses, because when the Germans ran out of fuel for their vehicles, they would grab nearby horses in order to still move the vehicles. And because of that, a lot of dead horses were over and over again. So the initial shock when you see the first ones yeah, that shock is there. You never get over it. And I'm sure some of you guys witnessed the very same thing. That initial shock is there. 
but by the time we entered Doc Howe, it was just more of the same, so to speak. If that answers your question. Here you go. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Bernard Wolf. Uh, I've done international business uh, throughout my career. One irony, and it's sort of the end point of all of this, is in, North, in uh, uh, South America, the, what you would normally see in each of these companies is they'd be owned by Jewish people that had fled into, uh, you know, into South America, and then invariably the people that were the uh, salesmen and uh, technology people, they were Nazis that had come in, and these some of them were some of the top people in business together. There's a messenger. Any more questions? Jay? Yeah. Hilbert, the, 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 photograph, the photograph of uh, the formal surrender, it listed three uh, news media personnel, one of whom was a woman. Yeah. That must have been highly unusual, I would think. Uh, did, did you have news media that were traveling with your unit or see well, any evidence of, of them? When General Linden, with his entourage, arrived for the surrender, Margaret Higgins, who was the famous reporter, I think for the Chicago Times or Chicago Tribune at the time, she was part. There was also, as it probably couldn't read it when I showed the picture. Uh, another reporter from, originally from Belgium, they were there because they got, you know, they got the information that the surrender was going to take place, so of course they wanted to be there. Um, and they were. Uh, there was an interesting story that developed on TV. The, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of, of the, what it's called that shows these TV movies based on the information provided by Colonel Sparks, 45th Division, before he died. And I have the verbal recorded version of his book. And he claimed, in charge of the 45th Division units, at the surrender, he approached General Linden, took out his pistol, 45, told General Linden, vamoose, that Sparks was in charge. Well, he was in charge of the German SS prisoner camp, I mean, the German army camp, not the prisoner camp. General Henning Linden, was there to accept the surrender of the prisoner camp. Now, picture General Linden standing there with his three armed bodyguards, <laughs> which is in the picture, and a colonel pointing a gun at him and telling him to get lost. I mean, and pointing his gun at him. And when I first heard that, I said, if that happened, that couldn't have happened to the army that I served in because he would have been court-martialed within minutes or hours. But that's what he claimed and that's what they showed in this movie, um, Netflix. I was contacted by the son of a veteran that was in my division, asked me to help him because that program and others, he was trying to contact them and get them to issue a correction. I said, look, I'll be glad to do whatever you want me to do. I'll try and contact them. He said he already had, got no response, but I said, you're wasting your time because I've learned through experience, whether it's a TV program, a radio program, whatever, once it's in the can, so to speak, 
They're not interested in anybody issuing corrections. It's there, it's done, it's over with. They're busy with the next production. <laughs> the media I, strikes again. Pardon? One last question. Not really a question. A thank you, Hilbert, for this. This was outstanding. And just to underscore, he's only scratched the surface. His interview and Howard's interview are both available on the History Center's website. Instead of watching the news tonight, go home and listen to these men talk about these amazing experiences they've had. Thank you, Hilbert. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Oh. If you're having trouble sleeping, this will help you out. Okay. These stories were written by these people here. Great. So. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.